Hey everybody, we're looking at today at section chapter six, excuse me, chapter six, Renaissance and Reformation going from 1300 to 1650. Our first section today is on the Renaissance. The Renaissance, which means rebirth or revival, began in Italy and spread north into other European countries. It was a time of a revival of learning in the beginning of the 14th century. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 caused many scholars from that city to travel to Europe. And when they came, they brought their learning to them. It caused a flood of information to come into Europe. There was a lot of different changes that had to take place for this revival of learning. And we're going to look at some of those tools. One is the... Um, Works will produce in the language of the people, allow Renaissance ideas to spread to many more people. And part of that was done by Johannes Gutenberg's invention of the movable type printing press. It made it a lot easier to be able to print things. You, they could mass produce now. Some of the ways that they painted or sculpted changed. Um, they had started using anatomy, the structure of humans, animals, and plants to be able to better paint things. They started using shading, which is a technique for adding dimension to figures and artwork. And also as perspective, to, is, which is a technique to add depth to paintings. All these made paintings look a lot better than what they did in previous years. Some of the famous artists coming out of the time, two men that stood out as Renaissance artists, both of them from Italy. You had Leonardo da Vinci. He is known for his paintings of the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa. And then, oops, sorry. Make sure you have this one highlighted that Leonardo da Vinci painted Mona Lisa. So this is his two paintings here, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. The other was Michelangelo. He was a Renaissance artist best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. He spent years basically laying on his back on a scaffolding, spent four years laying on his back on a scaffolding painting the ceiling. So the Sistine Chapel is a famous building in Rome whose ceiling was painted by Michelangelo. <laughs> this is a picture of the Sistine Chapel. These are some other sculptures that were done by Michelangelo. Renaissance sculptures follow the principles of classical art. Their sculptures resemble the sculptures of the Greeks and the Romans. They were lifelike, powerful, and stunning. They used rounded figures and showed anatomy and followed the rules of perspective. The artist brought flat structure to life. One of the greatest examples of Renaissance relief sculpture is the doors sculpted by Giberti for the Baptistry of Florence. And this is a picture of the door here, or part of the door. Looking at Renaissance architecture, it rejected most of the Gothic style the architects came to believe that pointed arches, tall towers, and flying buttresses were neither graceful nor beautiful. Instead, they wanted to return to the architectural style of the Greeks and Romans. Rounded arches, columns, and domes characterized Renaissance structures. The soaring towers and ornate decoration of Gothic cathedrals were considered old-fashioned. In contrast, Renaissance churches and palaces sat solidly balanced on the ground. The Cathedral of Florence, excuse me, pictured in your book, if you, it's on the left, but it's also this picture here, is a stunning example of the Renaissance architecture. Bruno Shelley designed the dome for this huge structure. He solved several architectural problems in order to construct the eight-sided dome. The structure demonstrated Bruno Shelley's keen understanding of mathematics. It even exceeded the one atop the Roman pantheon. Men like Bruno Shelley 
demonstrated that the Renaissance man had surpassed the ancient Romans whose knowledge they had used. Learning, students study the humanities. Humanities are things like reading, writing, reason. These were um, covered human interests, experiences, literature, philosophy, art, history, grammar, and speech. They covered a wide spectrum of human interests and experiences, as I said. The goal of Renaissance education was to make the student a well-rounded person, one who was educated and interested in many fields. All right, looking at some, some of the writers, the variation is, um, looking specifically in Italy and Northern Europe. In Italy, you had Patriarch, which was a pioneer of the Renaissance humanism and a central figure in Italian literature. He was known as the father of humanism. He composed poetry in Latin and followed the style of the ancient Roman poets. And then you had Castiglione, which was another Italian author. He wrote a famous book on etiquette, which is social behavior. It was called the courtier and it described proper conduct for the Renaissance man. You had Machiavelli. He worked for the government in Florence, Italy and observed political events in Europe. From his observation, he wrote a book called The Prince. Basically, he taught that those who live by the classical and biblical virtues would not be able to gain or keep power. If a virtue helped the ruler gain power, Machiavelli wrote that the ruler should use it. If not, the ruler should disregard it. In this way, Machiavelli demonstrated the Renaissance trend of freeing people from religious tradition. This would allow man to be, to be the measure of all things. So basically, Machiavelli's teachings was the means just, the end justifies the means. So whatever you wanted to get to, whatever your goal was, do whatever you could to get there. Even if it hurt somebody else or did whatever, do whatever you could to get there. And this obviously goes against what scripture teaches. Right. Northern Europe, you had Erasmus. He was highly regarded an influential scholar of the Renaissance who mastered both Latin and Greek. He was first to publish a Greek New Testament that was printed on a movable type press, which became an essential tool for the Reformation. At Thomas More, he was a close friend of Erasmus and served in the court of King Henry VIII in England. His work Utopia, which means nowhere, is a story about an imaginary country based on Christian principles and the philosophy of Plato. In this work, More presented his view of an ideal state. This was Utopia is basically a perfect society. If you ever seen the Disney movie Zootopia, it's kind of a play on words. There it was a perfect society. We're going to breeze through that for a minute. Okay. Whoop. There we go. <laughs> All right. So now we're at our next section. We're looking at 6.2, discontent with the Church of Rome. And that will then lead into the Reformation. All right. So some of the things that people began to have problems with in the Roman Church was their doctrine. Doctrines such as transubstantiation. This is the Roman Catholic doctrine that the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper would literally change into the very body and blood of Christ. Those who rejected this doctrine were charged with heresy, which heresy is worse that supposedly went against the Bible. Another teaching that had become accepted in the Church of Rome was the necess necessity of works in addition to faith for salvation. And church writings began to become equally as important to the Bible as a church authority, meaning writings by the Pope or whoever became just as important as the writings in the Bible. Requirement for believers to confess their sins to a priest. We know we read the Bible when Christ died, he became our high priest. We don't have to go through a priest to confess our sins. Do we confess our sins straight to Jesus who forgives us once and for all at one time? By the 13th century, more and more people questioned the teachings of Rome. And with that, what became persecution and the Roman church 
um, authorized an inquisition. It was a Roman church court set up to find and punish heretics. Some of the corruption that was a part of the Roman church. Pope Boniface VIII said that everyone, even kings, must submit to the, to the Pope in order to be saved. Then you had the Great Chisholm in 1378, which was basically a time where there were three different popes. Then the Council of Constance was where it, it was decided which one of those three would ultimately end up becoming pope. And then looking at corruption within the church. The church began to sell indulgences. Indulgences is a document issued by the Church of Rome granting pardon from the punishment of certain sins. Pope Leo X needed money to finish building St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So he started selling these indulgences. And these indulgences found their way to a certain place in Germany where a man there by the name of Martin Luther was a pastor of a church. And he opposed these indulgences and he actually wrote down his opposition on paper and nailed it to the door of the church in Germany, which was the tradition at the time of what you should do when you had a conflict with the church officials. And that began our Protestant Reformation. So we'll be looking more at that in just a minute or in the next chapter, next section, excuse me. So individuals often had to express their dissatisfaction with the corruption of the Roman church behind closed doors. Broad discontentment often found expression in the words of popular writers such as Erasmus. Right. What I want you to do now is I want you to get your books out. And this is not in Miss Wise's um, lesson plans, but I just thought about it and I would like for y'all to do it. Um, go to page 101. And up at the top, there is a short little excerpt from Erasmus writings in which Pope Julius II finds himself excluded from heaven by St. Peter. Um, two of you take two volunteers, Miss Wise, if nobody volunteers, you, you can... Um, draw six to pick the two volunteers but you can ultimately pick who the two are one gets to be julius and one gets to be saint peter i'd like you to read through these this little thing here the little kind of play the little excerpt from erasmus's writing is really good at showing how no matter what these people did with the church they, they thought they were good enough it wasn't enough to get them into heaven so you can do that before you start on your next part of your work. All right, so now we are on to chapter six, section three. We're looking at the Reformation. We're gonna be looking at the forerunners of the ex, ex yeah, excuse me, the Reformation. These are the guys who kind of set the stage for the Reformation to take place. Then we'll be looking at who these reformers are. We're going to look at the central doctrines of the Reformation and then the results and reaction of the Reformation. So there's forerunners. The Reformation literally means restoration or renewal. It was a time of transition into a different belief set. It was going back to the truth of the scripture. Some of those forerunners, you had John Wycliffe. He was a pastor, teacher, and theologian in England that produced the first Bible in the English language. You had John Huss, who was a pastor in Bohemia, who was influenced by Wycliffe's teachings, who was ultimately burned at the stake. And then there was Martin Luther. He wrote the 95 Theses. This was the man that I was talking about. He found out about the indulgences and he wrote these 95 Theses or these 95 problems that he had with the church and nailed these to the door of the church in Germany where he was pastoring at. And that began our reformation. He also translated the Bible into German. So these 95 theses are points of disagreements with the Roman Catholic Church. 
The church ignored Luther for a time, but finally threatened to dismiss him from the Roman church in 1520. This is a practice called excommunication. It's dismissing somebody from the Roman church and therefore denying them any chance for salvation. Luther himself was led to salvation by the biblical truth found in Romans 117. The just shall live by faith. There's nothing that you can do to be good enough to receive salvation. You have to live by faith in God alone. Luther went on to translate the New Testament and then the whole Bible into German. All right. Luther traveled freely through much of Germany and ministered until his death in 1545. Some more of the ref reformers. We have Ulrich Zwingli, who was born in a German-speaking area of Switzerland. He became acquainted with Erasmus and who encouraged him to study the Bible. He was a priest in the Roman church, but was displeased with the corruption he found there. And in 1519, he became the preacher at the largest church in Zurich, an important town in the Swiss city states. He read some of Luther's writings and realized that salvation comes by grace through faith. And he began to preach and teach from the Bible and made important changes in his church. Just as, um, Luther was pinning his 95 theses. Zwingli wrote a document known as the 67 Conclusions. He rejected many Roman doctrines such as mass, celibacy, purgatory, and exalted claims of the Pope. Then you had the Anabaptists. They were called Anabaptists because they were those who baptized again. This was a group of Zwingli's followers and they called themselves the Swiss Brethren but they became known as the Anabaptists because they began to baptize people again. Bat infant baptism was a big thing at this time. And they taught that you had, the infant baptism wasn't enough. You had to be baptized again. They rejected the idea that everyone who lived under a Lutheran or Reformed prince could be a member of the state church. Then you had John Calvin. He was born in France, was a leading figure of the Reformation. He ministered from Geneva, Switzerland, due to the hostility of the French government towards Protestants. He wrote um, a book called Institutes of the Christian Religion. And a big part of his teaching was predestination, which is God deciding one destinies before birth. Protestants are people who choose to follow scripture and lead the Roman Catholic Church. Other central doctrines. It was scripture alone, faith alone, priesthood of the believer, the Renaissance emphasis on the individual prayer to people to accept this doctrine. The reformers emphasize that people have come to God as individuals. Upon receiving salvation through Christ, each person is made a priest. They have direct access to the saving benefits of Christ. Right, so now looking at the results of the Reformation. Reformers oppose spiritual oppression. Reformers emphasize the role of Christians in society. Reformers emphasize roles of the family, placed priority on education. Now the reaction. The Catholic Church, of course, reacted to what was going on. They launched an extensive campaign to stop and reverse the spread of the Protestant movement. Sometimes known as the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation differ greatly from the Protestant Reformation. You had a group called the Jesuits. They were found to stop the spread of the Reformation. The Inquisition was reorganized by Pope Paul III to root out heresies. These court, church courts assumed that everyone who's accused of heresy was guilty. You had the book index of prohibited books. This was a list of books that were um, declared heretical by the Roman Catholic Church, meaning that they were bad. Most versions of the Bible and all Protestant literature was declared heretical. 
the Council of Trent met several times over a 20 year period and wrote a statement of Roman Catholic beliefs and practices. It was a first written statement that contained all Catholic doctrines. The council members affirmed the authority of both scripture and tradition. They insisted that faith and works were necessary to, to receive justification. They also preserved the doctrine of human priesthood that stood between God and the individual. So essentially, this um, the Roman church made no changes to its doctrines. And as with anything, when you have conflict, it led up to a war. So we're going to look at these wars of religion. Even though rulers and fans vigorously supported the Church of Rome, a number of Protestants continued to increase. Known as Huguenots, which were French Protestants during the Reformation. These French Protestants endured fierce persecution and broken promises of peace. In 1572, 20,000 Huguenots in Paris were massacred in their homes during a carefully planned attack. 17 years of fighting between Catholic and Protestant forces followed. In 1589, the French Protestants received, received a temporary reprieve relief when Henry of Navarre became King of France. He issued the Edict of Nantes which reaffirmed Catholicism as a state religion of France, but also granted Protestants religious toleration. There was the Thirty Years War began as a revolt by the Bohemians against loss of religious liberty, but soon became a major conflict between Catholic and Protestant forces in Europe. The Thirty Years War was the last great religious war in Europe. All right, and that's the end. Y'all stop there and y'all can do the rest of your work.